tonight taking charge, missing persons police now leading the investigation into the mysterious disappearance of Samantha Murphy. Bizarre video of Barnaby Joyce sprawled on a Canberra footpath after falling off a planter box. Emotions overflow outside court as four teens are found guilty of murdering Declan Cutler. Melbourne Airport accused of keeping the rail link grounded as a local council calls for an end to the stalemate. A who's who of Melbourne gathers at Town Hall to roast and toast Radio King Neil Mitchell. And the PM teams up with the Hawks to kickstart their new home in Dingley. This is Melbourne's Nine News with Alicia Loxley and Tom Steinford. Good evening. The missing person squad has taken over the investigation into the disappearance of Ballarat mum, Samantha Murphy. It's six days since she vanished, but police are adamant they still haven't uncovered anything sinister or suspicious. Nathan Curry has today's developments. Back searching, this time with missing persons detectives leading the way. The missing persons squad have additional resources. They also have subject matter expertise in relation to missing persons. Our searches in rural areas, particularly bushland. It's a big development six days since the mum of three went for a run and didn't return for a family brunch, but police are still holding out hope for a positive outcome. I can also confirm that we have not identified any suspicious or sinister circumstances. However, we do hold significant concerns for Samantha's welfare at this stage and that is growing as the days progress. The squad's detectives were out in the field this afternoon, not only providing support but also looking for clues in Sam's past. Absolutely, that'll be a huge part of our investigation, digging into the background, working out Samantha's movements in the days leading up to her disappearance and also the people that know her. Police are still working with telecom technicians in regards to Sam's phone. It pinged on Sunday, but police won't confirm what time that happened and if there are any other phones in the area. They also know that she was wearing a watch at the time. They haven't revealed if they've been able to obtain any data from it. And given the lack of CCTV, dash cam footage is what they're after. Police are now also helping to assist the Find Samantha Murphy Facebook page, which has more than 13,000 followers from around the world. We've had messages from the UK, Oklahoma, it's really going international. The Buninyong Anglican Church has opened its doors for anyone needing support. People are well and truly struggling but coming together, as uh, any community will do, and uh, just looking for ways in which they can help. The search will continue tomorrow as the rest of the country waits for news. And Nathan joins us live now from the Buninyong Police Station. Nathan, the search has wrapped up for today. Yes, Alicia. Police have told me they'll be back out on the ground tomorrow morning. It's not going to be as widespread tomorrow. Instead, they'll be just targeting designated area based on intel they have. They've even put away the community notice board that's been here all week with maps on it so people can come down, see which parts of town uh, they should try and search. They're still more than welcome to go out and search, but it's very much now in the hands of those missing uh, person squad detectives. They've made it clear they're going to keep searching, Alicia, until they find Samantha. OK, Nathan Curry there, thank you. A truck fire is causing delays on the Westgate Freeway with one outbound lane still closed near the Balti Bridge. That water tanker burst into flames just after three this afternoon. The explosion sending a piece of shrapnel flying, injuring a member of the public. Drivers are being warned to avoid the area as crews work to clear the scene. Barnaby Joyce has some explaining to do tonight. Video has surfaced of the former Deputy PM lying on a Canberra footpath. Here's our National Affairs Editor, Andrew Probin. Barnaby Joyce is no stranger to controversy. His personal life has regularly intruded into his public life and today's no different. A video has emerged of the former Deputy Prime Minister and Nationals leader sprawled on a Canberra pavement. It was late Wednesday night. He could be heard talking on his phone using colourful language. <laughs> Barnaby Joyce told Nine News he'd fallen off a planter box while chatting on his mobile. If I had known someone was there with a camera, I would have got up quicker, he told Nine News. Maybe some things simply defy explanation. Thieves have targeted homes in Melbourne's southeast in a string of break ins. Security cameras were rolling when a group of intruders wearing face coverings and gloves raided a Hyatt home. One woman was asleep upstairs as her property was ransacked around 3.30 this morning. Homes in Bentley and Bo Morris were also targeted with a number of cars stolen. Police are investigating if the break-ins are linked. 
Four teenagers have been found guilty of murder over the stabbing death of a 16-year-old boy in a gang attack in Reservoir. Declan Cutler suffered more than 150 injuries after he was ambushed in what the judge described as utter horror. Court reporter Amber Johnston. Declan Cutler's father overwhelmed with emotion as he embraces the legal team who helped bring his son's killers to justice. At the moment we're happy with what we've got. His mother sobbing in court as Judge Rita and Cherty face the four underage boys delivering the harshest verdict. The prosecution has proved the elements of murder beyond reasonable doubt. The 16-year-old was leaving a party in Reservoir in 2022 where tensions had been simmering between rival gangs. He was ambushed by a group of teenage boys armed with knives. The attack captured on CCTV. The closed circuit television footage has no sound, but it screams of horror. The court heard Declan stood no chance, sustaining more than 150 injuries in just two minutes, including 56 stab wounds. Declan was alone and unarmed when he was set upon, and he was utterly defenceless. Against eight gang members in total, two of whom were on bail for other crimes. Seven have been jailed over the attack, and one, just 13 at the time, walked free. Before the boys entered the courtroom, they could be heard yelling, almost hyping each other up. And as they were let out, one shouted, damn boy, in response to the guilty verdict. A moment of relief, but the painful journey is far from over, with the teenagers to be sentenced at a later date. Amber Johnston, Nine News. An earthquake woke residents in Victoria's southeast this morning. The magnitude 4.3 quake striking near the South Gippsland town of Leangatha. That was just before one at a depth of less than 10 kilometres. More than 5,000 reports were made to Geoscience Australia. The main hub for the first reports is the south uh, eastern part, uh, the suburbs of uh, Melbourne itself. But, you know, there are, as I said, you know, there are uh, felt reports all over uh, Victoria. The earthquake was felt as far away as South Australia and Tasmania, but no damage was reported. Melbourne Airport is refusing to cave despite growing pressure from the state government and Mooney Valley Council to approve plans for the long-awaited rail link. As Justine Conway reports, $10 billion is sitting idle as the stalemate continues. Celebrating Chinese New Year. Melbourne Airport is still a long way off celebrating a new rail link. We want this to move as quickly as possible and we are certainly not blocking the development. As it records an increase in international and domestic passengers, early work on the $10 billion airport rail link is still on pause and Mooney Valley Council is fed up waiting. All three levels of government are in agreement. Let's just get this done. The standoff began in April. Melbourne Airport wants an underground train station it says will deliver passengers directly to terminals. But under state government plans, it would be built above ground. Both the Allen government and Canberra agreed to the above ground plan under a 50-50 funding model. But with $10 billion on the table, the stalemate continues. I've never been contacted by a constituent that cares whether Melbourne Airport's train station is underground or overground. The Premier is losing patience too. It's up to the airport to explain. Uh, the organisation that's not putting a dollar, they're not putting a dollar into this project, why they want to see a more expensive outcome. Ultimately, the state government does need the airport's approval to start work here. A federal government appointed mediator will be employed within the next few months in the hope that all parties can finally come to an agreement. We only get one shot at it and getting it right is really important. Justine Conway, Nine News. The Reserve Bank Governor is keeping her cards close to her chest on the future of interest rates. Facing a parliamentary committee, Michelle Bullock dodged questions on when they might fall. Finance Editor Chris Kohler. Those in charge of the economy today lined up to answer questions on interest rates but remain firmly on the fence. At this stage, the board hasn't ruled out a further increase in interest rates, but neither has it ruled it in. A bet each way, three days after leaving the cash rate on hold at 4.35%, Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock ducked and dodged the topic on the minds of millions of Australians. When will interest rates start falling? Well, there's some encouraging signs. Australia's inflation challenge isn't over. An inflation rate with a four in front of it isn't good enough and it's still some way from our, the midpoint of our target. 
Rate cuts are now widely forecast this year, but the governor says we won't have to wait until inflation drops below 3%. She was, though, careful not to give much else away. It's not a, an absolute science, it's, it's an art. That caution, though, isn't being shared by the property market. Prices hit new record highs last month and new data shows that last week was the second busiest start to an auction year on record. Buyers, it seems, are starting to bank on lower interest rates ahead. It does seem that the market has responded a little bit more positively at the beginning of this year, given uh, a growing expectation that we could see a rate cut later this year. And that expectation sets up a big year for real estate. Chris Kohler, Nine News. A fired-up Joe Biden has rejected a withering assessment of his memory and mental abilities contained in a special counsel report. His predecessor was also on the defensive today, insisting he should remain on the 2024 presidential ballot. More from Alison Petrowski. Cleared of criminal charges, the US president tried to wave off the special counsel's scathing assessments. If there are no charges should be brought in this case. But Robert Hur's investigation questioned Joe Biden's mental health, assessing he would likely present to jurors as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Further, he did not remember when he was vice president. He did not remember, even within several years, when his son Bo died. Visibly angry, the president called a national address to respond. I don't need anyone to remind me when he passed away of claiming his interviews with special counsel took place one day after the Hamas attacks when he was managing an international crisis. He then misspoke on the topic. Initially, the president of Mexico, El Sisi, did not want to open up the gate. Calling Egypt's El Sisi the leader of Mexico. Although cleared, the report added that Biden's haphazard storage of classified materials presented serious risks to national security. I did not share classified information. Biden seeks to distance himself from the former president's federal classified documents case. Traitor is a traitor. Today, Donald Trump's legal team were on the defensive for a different matter as the Supreme Court considered if he should be kicked off the 2024 presidential ballot after the state of Colorado struck him off the Republican primary. The Colorado Supreme Court's decision is wrong. President Trump did not engage in any act that can plausibly be characterised as insurrection. Colorado's lawyers argued that the US Constitution prevents anyone who engaged in insurrection from holding office, but they were met with a frosty response from the bench. And it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. A daunting prospect, they appeared poised to back the former president, who stayed away from today's proceedings. We're leading everybody. We are right now. Is there any way we can call the election for next Tuesday? That's all I want. In the United States, Alison Petrowski, Nine News. Well, back home in the Hawks today, recruited a VIP to turn the first sod on their new $100 million training facility at Dingley. Sporting a brown and gold scarf, Anthony Albanese was joined by club and AFL leaders. The development is being touted as a game changer and will feature full broadcast capabilities and grandstand seating, as well as a community pavilion. It's hoped it will be ready in time to host AFLW games from 2025. They may well have been sparring partners in the past, but the Prime Minister joined a long list of luminaries at Melbourne Town Hall today, paying tribute to radio legend Neil Mitchell. Amid all the celebrations of Mitchell's remarkable career, there was a stitch-up or two. Tony Jones was there. As power lunches go, this one packed a punch. Neil Mitchell is a legend, a giant of uh, radio. A giant he might be, but not even Neil, with his dodgy knee is immune from being cut down to size. I was basically just live bait, to be frank. Neil would carve you up on radio for the enjoyment of the audience and for the continuation of his ratings. This was Mitchell's official farewell, having relinquished his 3AW morning show more than two months ago. The long goodbye attracting the who's who of politics, sport, science, media and industry. Lindsay Fox. Is here. I suspect he's scoping the town hall to buy it. Why not? He already owns the government. Mind you, there were times when Neil must have felt like he owned the government. I remember being at the lodge one night uh, where Howard said to me, we've got to shut up Neil Mitchell. And while roast wasn't on the menu today, there was a roasting. 
He was constantly obsessed there were bands that were famous about 10 years ago. I never had the heart to tell him that we needed ones that were famous 25 to 30 years ago so we could actually afford them. The city is still adjusting to mornings without Mitchell, but there are some who might just be grateful he's gone. First, a few apologies. Dan Andrews, the former Premier, he would love to be here. He wasn't invited. There was ribbing aplenty today, but the overriding sentiment was one of adulation. So to you, mate, I wish you well in your future endeavours. A few hours in and the lunch was over, unlike Neil's career, which is refusing to yield to retirement. We're all passing through. We're all temporarily relevant. Tony Jones, Nine News. And now here is Tony with a look ahead to tonight's sport. Thank you, Alicia. Good evening. Coming up, awkward or what? Warren Treadray, the former Port star who wanted to get rid of the coach, Ken Hinckley, has just been elected to the board. Oh, I don't think there's been a need to smooth anything no, over. Absolutely no awkwardness at all. Magpies, a young hopeful, suffers a nasty setback and it couldn't have come at a worse time. A kangaroo favourite facing a free agency decision. Why this swim star would consider competing in a contest where everyone's doping? In basketball, Chris Golding finds himself in a jam, while for the Opals, a perfect result against Brazil. <laughs> Did we see the cat? <laughs> no. I, I no. missed the cat. Anyway. I was wondering That's the, the tease, joke was, but That's the, the cord, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The best jokes are the ones you have to explain. <laughs> yeah. And I had to explain that. <laughs> That's good. awkward. Yeah. That actually is awkward. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. We'll see you shortly. When Nine News Melbourne returns, though, the tobacco war escalates. Innocent residents forced to flee as a Caulfield shop is firebombed. Queen Camilla reveals how King Charles is doing as he begins cancer treatment. And eyes on the prize Olympic medalists to take home a piece of Paris. Innocent people have escaped injury after being dragged into the escalating tobacco war. Residents living above a Caulfield South business were forced to evacuate when it was set alight at around 2.30 this morning. Firefighters managed to contain the blaze to that store, which only opened three weeks ago. I just got a call from the staff saying, like, someone bonfired the shop. I was, like, literally shocked. Like, I never thought it was going to happen to one of our stores, and unfortunately it happened. It's believed the offenders used a stolen vehicle to ram the shop front. They are the future of air warfare, pilotless killer drones. And Australia is tonight a step closer to having our own homegrown fleet. If that ambitious project goes to plan, it could become a lucrative defence export. Andrew Probin again. Meet the Ghost Bat, Australia's next generation fighter. A crewless killer drone, it can go on bombing or surveillance raids alone or provide extra firepower for piloted stealth missions. This technology has the potential to turn a single fighter jet into a fighting team with advanced sensors that are like hundreds of eyes in the sky. Ghost bats are the first combat aircraft designed and built in Australia for 50 years. A project begun under the previous government, it's receiving another $400 million to take it to market. Both for the Australian Air Force and for international customers in time. Not only sort of a domestic benefit but uh, this will enhance our global reputation. But it's the reputation and quality of the ADF that's under fire from the Defence Minister. There is a way to go before we have that culture of excellence. I suspect uh, Richard's frustrated as I was uh, with the delivery of some of the programs and the cost overruns. Another source of tension is a difference of opinion between Defence and its civilian masters on what projects should be a priority. We need to be uh, faster in our decision making and faster in our delivery. The speed of the boss is the speed of the team and Richard Miles is low speed and high drag. Defence has a well-earned reputation as a department that eats its ministers. There were six in nine years under the coalition but Anthony Albanese is backing his man. We have a fantastic minister in the Defence Minister. Andrew Proben, Nine News. The Queen has given an update on the King days after he shared his cancer diagnosis. Camilla was visiting Salisbury Cathedral in England South where she was asked how her husband was handling his treatment. He's doing extremely well under the circumstances and he's very touched by all the letters and messages. You know, all the public has been settled from everywhere. That's very cheering. 
Charles has postponed all public duties while he undergoes treatment. The gold, silver and bronze medalists will take home an extra souvenir when they leave the Paris Olympics and Paralympic Games. As Jane Azapardi explains, a tiny piece of the Eiffel Tower is being incorporated into the centre of each medal. It's the moment an athlete becomes an icon. The pinnacle of any sporting career and in Paris, the pinnacle of the city itself at least a piece of it. We wanted to have this French touch and we thought that the Eiffel Tower would be this cherry on the top. The design for the gold, silver and bronze Paris 2024 medals now unveiled. In 2024, the dream is a bijou and Paris is the At their centre, 18 grams of iron from the original Eiffel Tower, built in 1889. The pieces of iron had been taken from the Eiffel Tower during routine maintenance over the years and stored in a warehouse. Now, shaped into a hexagon and set like a jewel, surrounded by precious metal, crafted by a luxury French jeweller into ridges designed to sparkle. To have the Eiffel Tower present in the middle, it's uh, for us the best demonstration that uh, we want to, to offer the best of France uh, to all the athletes. Aussie kayaker Tom Green won gold in Tokyo. He's ready to add to the collection. The design looks so cool, but at the end of the day, you know, we're not doing it for the design, we're doing it for what it stands for and what the Olympics are. 168 days to go. Jane as a party, Nine News. Hopefully plenty of those medals heading for Australia. Madeline Spark joins us now from Werribee Open Range Zoo. And Maddie, we're in the midst of a sunset safari season. That's right, we are, Tom. It's a unique wildlife experience through the African-inspired savanna and it runs for a limited time. And to tell us more about it, I'm joined by zookeeper Alison Norris. Hi, Alison. Hello. Now, the, there's always some new arrivals to look out for at this year's Sunset Safari. Who have we got that's, that's new? That's exactly <laughs> right. So this year is extra special. Um, really good time to come out and do our Sunset Safari. We have oryx calves. We have five oryx calves up and moving around. We have zebra foals. Um, everyone is extremely active this time of night um, and it's a pretty amazing time to see these animals. Incredible. And all of the funds raised from this goes towards a great cause. That's exactly right. So uh, Zoo Victoria has got a very special partnership with UEC, which is the Uganda Wildlife uh, Conservation uh, Centre. And um, they help um, do wildlife programs um, and help the communities kind of uh, engage in ways that can um, really support the um, Ugandan wildlife and have a bit more of a um, positive relationship with them too. Incredible. Well, thanks for showing us around here this no afternoon, worries. Alison. And I'll be back a little later with some details on a warm weekend for you later in the Bulletin, Alicia. Looking forward to it, Maddie. We'll see you soon. Well, after the break for you, new direction, how Geelong's Ford factory is shifting gears. State of emergency in Iceland as another volcanic eruption causes chaos. And a moose joins skiers hitting the slopes in Wyoming. Geelong's proud tradition of manufacturing was dealt a severe blow when the Ford plant closed its doors, but Alan Rascal tells us all has not been lost, with new manufacturing now taking place at the old factory, creating jobs for locals. Building new homes at Ford's old home. Company Kloss making a range of prefabricated homes at the old Ford plant in Geelong. NDIS approved, emergency accommodation, affordable housing and then high-end accommodation. It was the original home of Ford in Australia where cars rolled off the production line from 1925, cementing a proud manufacturing base in Geelong which continued until Ford ceased production in 2016. Malcolm Stapleton was a 17-year-old apprentice at the Ford factory. Now 61, he trains apprentices at the new home building business. It's exciting to see that they've repurposed the building for further industries. Among the apprentices, Dakota West and Dutor Mong. Now, you're a first-year apprentice. What is it like being able to live and work in your local community? I really like it. It's good to be close to home. It's good for the, um, the locals. Like, I've got a few blokes in here that live close here. The company currently employs 40 locals with plans to increase that number to 100 by year's end. 
The prefabricated homes range from $130,000 to $800,000. When you walk through this old site, you can not only see its rich manufacturing history, but you can also feel it. All those working here proud to walk in the footsteps of those who've gone before them. You wouldn't want to see this place get ripped down because it's such like an original thing, getting all the cars built in here and then now you have something else being built in here. Alan Ruskell, Nine News. For the third time in two months, a volcano has roared to life in Iceland. A state of emergency has now been declared after lava destroyed pipelines that provide hot water to surrounding towns in the middle of winter. Edward Godfrey has more. The roar of molten lava. Sparking and bubbling in the early morning sun, a stream burning 1,200 degrees, churning through snowy surrounds. In its line of fire, this digger, the construction vehicle, ploughs on with its work metres from danger. Eventually, it's forced to turn away with minutes to spare. A road near one of Iceland's top attractions, the Blue Lagoon, cut off. A fiery mess pouring across the bitumen, engulfing the highway, leaving several cars stranded. There had been warning signs before the volcano erupted near the town of Grindavik, with hundreds of small earthquakes in recent days. This is the third volcanic eruption on the country's Reykjanes Peninsula in recent months. The last one sent lava into homes in Grindavik in January. The small town has been evacuated for weeks. For the foreseeable future, the town is basically uninhabitable. Um, there would need to be a cessation of activity in this volcanic system. I think the government has, in the process of buying up everybody's houses to allow them to move on with their lives, but you've broken up an entire community by this eruption. This time, the town was spared, but key pipelines haven't been. A state of emergency declared after infrastructure that delivers hot water was destroyed by lava. Nearby residents now urge to conserve as much water and electricity as possible in the dead of winter. In London, Edward Godfrey, Nine News. Causing a stir as it crashes down a ski slope, a moose has joined skiers and boarders at the popular Jackson Hole Resort in the American state of Wyoming. The holiday makers were forced to pick up their pace or quickly pivot out of the path because look at him go. They were trying to avoid getting hit by a crazy moose on the loose. Oh, gosh. <laughs> As if it's not scary enough skiing. Okay. <laughs> Ahead in Melbourne's Nine News, hidden costs, credit card surcharges, surcharges, slugging each Australian consumer almost $150 a year. Regional hospitals to benefit from the Good Friday appeal for the first time. And the big names set to star in this year's Super Bowl commercials. Australians are paying hundreds of dollars a year to make purchases as banks cash in on the tap-and-go frenzy. Billions in surcharges are stinging small businesses and consumers, but as Abby Geron explains, there are ways you can save. At Alta Community Coffee, your morning brew won't come with an additional cost for paying with plastic. We don't pass on the surcharges um, to our customers. We feel that yeah, we absorb those as a business. Even though 85% of the Termside Cafe's customers are going cashless. Like hospitality has been doing it tough recently and so we understand that businesses might need to increase those fees. And what we find is like customers really just want transparency about those things. Experts say we're now forking out $140 a year each to make purchases electronically as banks continue to hike the cost of tap and go transactions. They can take a $100 debit card transaction, send it to FBOS, pay about 30 cents but then charge the merchant up to $1.90 for that transaction. So about a six, seven, eight hundred percent markup. Aussies are leading the world in the cashless revolution, making on average 730 electronic transactions per person last year, a figure that's more than doubled in the past decade. But we're one of the only nations where surcharging's permitted. You can surcharge, but no more than cost of acceptance. In other markets, it's completely banned. It pays to pay attention because fees can range considerably. For example, when purchasing a seat on a Qantas flight, you can pay 0.3% on top when using a MasterCard debit card or a 1.01% surcharge when using a Visa credit card. The popular Square contactless terminals add a processing fee of up to 1.9%. Potentially, as those surcharges start to erode household budgets, we may see people returning to cash. And we know that if you use cash, you're 
more likely to spend less and budget better than simply tapping and going. Abby Gearan, Nine News. Five regional health services will share in the Good Friday Appeals funds for the first time. Two and a half million dollars will be split in what's been described as a huge win for country health care that will help children receive treatment closer to home. It is about trying to take, uh, raise as much money um, and help every, as many people as we can. Almost $4.6 million was raised by regional Victorians during last year's appeal. Well, records have been smashed on Wall Street with investors increasingly bullish about the economic outlook. Chris Kohler wraps up the week in finance. Wall Street's main index briefly topped 5,000 points overnight for the first time ever. It's gained nearly 5% in the last month, with Meta up 30%, Disney up 20% and Microsoft up 10%. Hasn't even seemed to matter that Tesla has nosedived. Here on our market, record highs this month, but not today. The ASX finished steady with major stocks showing a mixed bag of gains and losses. And the Australian dollar heads into the weekend worth less than 65 US cents. It's also buying 60 euro cents and 51 and a half British pence. Melbourne's radio wars are heating up with Jace Hawkins and Lauren Phillips set to go head to head with the rival station they were dumped from. The former Kiss FM hosts will reunite in Nova 100's breakfast slot later this year. Kiss was criticised for ditching that duo in favour of Sydney based Kyle and Jackie O. America's advertisers are rubbing their hands ahead of Monday's Super Bowl. When the big event kicks off, millions will be tuning in, not just for the on-field action and the blockbuster halftime show, but for the, all of the star-studded commercials in between. Lauren Tomasi reports from Las Vegas. This is an Aquaman's audition for a musical or Peppa Pig's breakout role on the big screen. Now, if there were only someone made of pigskin. Bingo. Oh, dear. It's a sip of soda and your first taste of Super Bowl 58. Tom, do you mind being an angel and sliding over just the thing? And one more big step right there and perfect. Big commercials, big names and big bucks. 30 seconds of airtime during the Super Bowl is costing brands almost $11 million. Mr. Messi. But it's not just all drinking beer and eating wings. There's a new fan base in football, and advertisers know it. I find you guilty of reckless spending and sentence you to $14 glowy skin. Taylor Swift credited with bringing a booming female audience. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, um, okay. Can we not? Uber Eats, as usual, bringing an A-list cast. So David and I are going to be in a little commercial. Be honest. I be am. honest. <sighs> okay. It's a big commercial. Posh and Bex working alongside an Australian to bring this ad to life. The T-shirt was actually her idea, and that just, again, gives you a bit of a sense of, of how up for this they were. Super Bowl 58 is expected to bring a record number of viewers. Why? Maybe it's the ads, or the football, or Taylor Swift, or maybe it's all of them, along with the halftime show. This year, it's Usher. Definitely has been a challenge to squeeze 30 years into 13 minutes. The R&B king preparing to pack a punch. He says there may be surprise guests, but Sin City and the world will have to wait and see. In Las Vegas, Lauren Tamazi, Nine News. All right, let's get more sport now. Tony Jones. I found the cat. And Did you use it? Yeah, it's on the basketball court. You'll see it very shortly. <laughs> okay. Anyway, thank you. Uh, coming up after the break, even more important matters, Warren Treadray returns to port. Could that spell trouble for the coach? Also, an emotional youngster's unlucky setback. The timing is awful. Hawthorne Royalty descends on Dingley for a historic day. Our exclusive chat next. And why James Magnuson plans to juice to the gills. He'll explain that. A sense of unease at Port Adelaide with one of coach Ken Hinckley's biggest critics, Warren Treadray, elected to the board. But Treadray, a premiership captain, is trying to play down any concerns of a fractured relationship with Hinckley. Matt Yanides reports. They haven't always seen eye to eye, but today Warren Treadray and David Koch stood side by side after the premiership captain was narrowly voted onto the Port Adelaide board. Oh, I don't think there's been a need to smooth anything no, over. Absolutely no awkwardness at all. Warren and I will be arguing, continue to argue as well because we're passionate about the club.
Treadray has been a vocal critic of coach Ken Hinckley, saying his position was untenable after a slow start to 2023. But the feud won't tear them apart. When you're in the media industry, it's a, an opinion-based industry. If you get crucified for showing passion and care and integrity and honesty, I think we're, we're not doing it right. There's no questioning Cam Zerha's commitment to North Melbourne this season. I love this playing group. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun here. But the restricted free agent isn't in a hurry to decide where he plays next year. The chance to feature in September a big lure for the forward who hasn't played finals in his eight seasons at the Roos. Oh, I just want to win games. I want to play finals. I'm coming into my eighth year now. I don't want to be at the bottom for the rest of my career. Alistair Clarkson has some injury concerns ahead of this month's practice matches. Small forward Paul Curtis was helped from the field after spraining his ankle. Hugh Greenwood and Bailey Scott missed today's session as they nurse injuries. Collingwood list hopeful Josh Eyre fought back tears after going down with a leg injury in match simulation. The former Essendon VFL player is widely tipped to secure the final spot on the Pies rookie list. Nat Yanides, Nine News. As we reported earlier in the news, the Prime Minister turned the first sod at Hawthorne's new headquarters at Dingley today, but the PM was later upstaged when some of the club's legends took in the new surrounds. Few clubs can boast a roll call of champions like Hawthorne. Today, a sprinkling of those champs gathered at the soon-to-be new home of the Hawks, Dingley. It's just so exciting and I'd be very, very disappointed if every single Hawthorne person in the whole country wasn't excited about this. Peter Hudson, Peter Knights and John Platten join coach Sam Mitchell in looking to the future. Every time you come you see more progress and um, you know, so many people had such great vision to get us to this point. Between them, these blokes have amassed a dozen premierships. The real bond, though, is their undying love for the club. I was so fortunate that I was able to experience that tribalism, that community footy, when Hawthorne played South Melbourne at Glen Ferry, or we went to Windy Hill to play against the Bombers. It was a great era. The new 28-hectare Dingley headquarters should be ready next year and heralds yet another leg in a journey which had its beginnings in the heartland of Hawthorne, Glenferry Oval. As a full forward, I was pretty happy to play on Glenferry because the ball got down quickly and uh, full forwards like it. Where the faster it gets down there, the better. The atmosphere at Glenferry was just remarkable. You know, I think the record crowd we had there was about 36,000 just terracing, so shoulder to shoulder. While the ghosts of Glenferry might still roam the old nest, John Kennedy continues to look over his club at the current Waverley Digs, the club's home since 1992. It also holds special memories. I love the, the, the wide ground and the big grounds. The memories which I have are, are fantastic, so I'm sure that we can slowly bring that over here to Dingley. Soon, the Hawks will get the packing boxes out again for the move to Dingley, including those 13 Premiership Cups. But there's always room for one more. If you've got great facilities, good resources, good people, that'll attract players, coaches, support group. And we're going to have those sort of facilities. So certainly our players are not going to have any excuses. There's some great names there, isn't there? Well, a subpar effort at the Basketball World Cup has lit the fuse inside the Boomers camp ahead of the Olympics. And while Melbourne United star Chris Golding has his sights set on Paris, today he couldn't keep his eyes off another form of the game. Braden Ingram explains. In a distinctive location where shoes equal style, this is basketball, but not as you know it. You'll see some things out here uh, that you definitely won't see on an NBL court, that's for sure. Melbourne United star Chris Golding loving every minute of streetball tournament Summer Jam. It makes for a welcome distraction with United in prime position to lock down the NBL minor premiership. If we win one or two of our, out of our last three, we'll secure a top spot. No rest for the wicked. We want to we wanna win this thing and, and it starts with securing top spot. It's set to be a hectic six months for Australia's men who were desperate to make amends in Paris after their worst performance in a decade at the World Cup. There's a little bit of a bad taste in all of our mouths. We sort of spoke that that's half time. The second half is coming up at the Olympics. It was as if an Olympic medal was on the line at Summer Jam today. The three-day tournament setting up shop in St Kilda. Now into its 12th year, it's the country's largest basketball festival. Where we come from, like, basically just mates at the park to, to a full-fledged basketball festival holding you know national championships the festival will culminate here on sunday night with the men's and women's grand finals the winners to take home twenty thousand dollars in cold hard cash
The Opals took their first step to qualifying for Paris, surviving a scare from Brazil and this feline court invader. What a game. We've seen it all tonight. While over in the States, Ben Simmons got his claws out in the Nets' heated loss to Cleveland. Braden Ingram, Nine News. Australian selectors have warned fans to be patient with all-rounder Cameron Green. Green has retained his place in the middle order for Australia's test tour of New Zealand later this month, but is still finding his feet at test level. He'll get better and better, um, learn more about his game, but like any player, I don't think it's going to be a, a straight line. I think there'll be fluctuations throughout, um, as there always is. Veteran Michael Nessa is the only new name to be added to the squad. Victorian Scott Boland will also be on the plane. All right, now you try and work this one out. Olympic swimmer James Bagnuson has revealed an extraordinary plan to take performance-enhancing drugs at a newly founded Enhanced Games. The 32-year-old retired in 2019, but a $1.5 million prize is his to take if he can break the 50 metres freestyle record. You know when you sit around the, at the pub with your mates and you say, what would you do for a million bucks? I'd try and break a world record for a million bucks. <laughs> so that was the first thing. Hmm. The controversial Enhanced Games will not be subjected to drug testing and are slated to be held in December. Wow. So Great role models. <laughs> that is a bizarre concept, but yeah. I'm glad we got to see the cat. Yeah, we did too. Yeah, who wasn't on anything. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't walk very well, so... Did go missing. OK. We should probably go back to Maddie at that point. Who is at Werribee Zoo? It's a lovely evening out there on the Savannah, Maddie. That's right, it really is, Alicia. There's been breaks of sunshine and it's quite mild, but we have a warm day ahead of us tomorrow before the heat really ramps up on Sunday. I'll have all the details next. <laughs> Hello again from Werribee Open Range Zoo. At this time of year, the zoo offers their unique sunset safaris and this year there's adorable new arrivals to look out for. The zoo is now home to three young giraffes which are just one and two years old and they're sharing the savannah with five scimitar horned oryx calves which are a rare species of antelope. There's also other incredible animals you can get close to on the guided bus tour. On top of that, there's African-inspired music and performances to enjoy and all the funds raised go towards wildlife research and animal rescues. It stayed cool today. Despite plenty of afternoon sunshine, the city dipped to 18 and only climbed three degrees, peaking at 21. It was one degree warmer here in Werribee, 22. Most of Melbourne dropped to 16 or 17 degrees overnight. Ferny Creek was much cooler, 13, and it went on to reach 19 degrees. There were maximums of 22 or 24 elsewhere. Further out, the state's south also climbed to the low to mid-20s. It reached the 30s in the north. A cold front pushed in cloud and cooler winds over the state's south today, but temperatures will increase tomorrow as a high-pressure system drifts closer. By Sunday, that system will move over the Tasman and winds will shift to northerlies. They'll drag warm air from the interior over us, so it is set to heat up, with northern districts expected to reach the high 30s. And the heat will push further over the state on Monday, delivering another hot day. Taking a look around the country for tomorrow, it'll be another scorcher in Perth, 41 degrees, 31 with blue skies in Adelaide, 21 in Hobart and Sydney, and Brisbane can expect a shower or two. Back home, it's set to reach sunny tops of 33 or 34 degrees along the Murray. There'll be maximums in the low to mid-20s in the south, and it's expected to drop to 13, 14 or 15 degrees across Melbourne. Just 10 at Fernie Creek, though, but it should rebound to reach 25. And there'll be maximums of the mid to high 20s elsewhere and 29 at Scoresby. After a low of 13, Geelong is heading for a partly cloudy top of 25. The city should reach 27 with some sunshine after a low of 15. And then we've got a run of days in the 30s. 33 on Sunday, 37 on Monday, a warm low of 25 on Tuesday, then tw uh, 35. But winds will pick up in the afternoon. A cool change after that in the early evening and then we'll be getting... Cooler on Wednesday, 20 and 22 on Thursday. And the Sunset Safari is only running on Saturday nights until the 9th of March, so a few weeks left to come on down and see the animals at dusk. Looks beautiful, Maddie. Thank you very much for that. And that is Nine News this Friday. Ali is next with The Current Affair. We hope you have a fantastic weekend. From all of us, good night.